Hey guys, welcome back to the MVM Show. I'm Titus, your host today, and today I'm joined with an awesome dog trainer uh, today, and more than just that, but uh, Barton Ramsey from Southern Oak Kennels. How are you doing today, Barton? I'm doing great, man. Excited to chat with you. Yeah, me too. I got, uh, man, I asked some questions uh, on social media last night, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and was uh, a little overwhelmed with it, so... Everybody listening in that's asked your questions, if we don't get to them, I apologize. Maybe we can get to it on the next one. I know we've already talked about doing more than just one, so we'll do what we can today and and knock out what we can, but we also don't want to rush through anything and love to, excited to hear your wisdom and everything that you got going on there at Southern Oak Kennels. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm stoked to chat with you for sure. So, Barton, why don't you tell us where you're at? Um, tell us about Southern Oak Kennels, how it came about and just what you got going on. I know you got a lot of things going on, different locations too. Yeah. Um, I'm in North Mississippi. I was born and raised here. Didn't grow up, um, doing really anything in the, in the hunting space. I love the outdoors, but um, I didn't come from a hunting family and I did have Springer Spaniels and they were from working lines just kind of by chance. Um, a friend of mine, my dad's friend had them and I thought they were super cool. So I got one. And, um, when I moved back here from Dallas, Texas in 2009, a guy from my church, uh, I actually ran into this guy the other day. First time I've seen him in years. Um, he asked if I wanted to go duck hunt. I was like, well, I've never been duck hunting, but that sounds pretty fun. And this guy is, um, just, uh, prime example of what really needs to happen in order to increase duck hunting numbers and uh and get people into the sport he took me to get my license um i had done hunter safety in high school so i had all that stuff ready but i never never bought a hunting license at that point we bought my stamps um he let me borrow everything i could possibly need except for a pair of waders i bought like a 65 five dollar pair of like red leg waders or something <laughs> like that yeah. And, um, he took me duck hunting and we shot one duck and I'm the one that shot it. And I was like, dude, this is really fun. <laughs> Looking back on it now, it was a miserable duck hunt, but <laughs> my, for my first duck hunt, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And, um, man, I, I, I got home and he said, Hey, let's go again next week. I've got a place where we probably shoot some more ducks. And I was like, cool. Uh, do you think I could bring my dog? I had a Springer Spaniel who was at the time like seven, had never even been around gunfire. So it was honestly a very poor idea. Uh, but she loved to retrieve and she retrieved anything, anything she could find, she'd retrieve it. And um, he said, sure, I guess that's fine. So I took my dog and we went to this guy's catfish pond with like, I don't even know how many people were there. It honestly was a lot more like a dove hunt. Mm. And we sat around these catfish ponds and shot hooded mergansers <laughs> Um and there were like 25, 30 people there shooting. And my dog picked up so many ducks. Holy smokes. And I was like, well, this is the coolest thing ever. And I was really hooked. And so it's a very lengthy journey from there to breeding and training British Labradors. Um, but that was sort of the start of it. And um, over the course of the next several years, I started Southern Oak Kennels in 2012. So we just turned 10. Uh, I started training dogs right after that, just training spaniels um, and then Labradors. So I, I, it, it was one of those hobbies that you start and just kind of takes over your life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so started Southern Oak and and at the time I was working as a discipleship pastor in a church, and m- one of my jobs was to foster and you know grow our community uh, within our church, and so. It was just naturally one of the things I did when we started Southern Oak was build this community around what we were doing um, via social media, as well as just the people that we sold dogs to really became friends. And we we hunted together and trained dogs together. And over time, through a series of just things lining up and making a lot of sense, um, me and all the guys that, that run Southern Oak locations just said, hey, look, this is a natural fit. I think a lot of people ask if you can like buy a Southern Oak location or, or franchise it out. And mm. we do have a lot of people from the West coast who who are like, Hey, we, we need a Southern Oak out here. And I'm like, look, it just hadn't happened yet. It's one of those things that mm. none of it was, was necessarily, I never sat down and said, strategically speaking, where can we put yeah. eight Southern Oak kennels? You know, mm. it was always just, Hey, this guy that we've been hunting together, training together, he's bought dogs from us. He's going to be breeding these dogs. And it just makes a lot more sense if it's a part of our team. 
um, that's sort of how it's, how it's all fallen together and how we wound up with, uh, the locations we have and the people we have working for us now. Wow. And how many locations do you have Barton? We have, it's, it's, it's kind of confusing. So technically speaking, there are seven right now. Um, but kind kind of eight. So I'm, I'm technically what they call headquarters. Um, but then just right down the road from me, I have what we call the girls dorm mm. and, um, Lynn Reed who works for me, she, she's my, my puppy doula. So she raises all of our pups. She's like the, the puppy expert for us. And, um, I don't like the puppies that we raise here necessarily being raised where lots of traffic comes in and out. Mm. Um, cause we've had some incidents in the past mm. where people maybe visited another kennel or even a shelter and came to the house and brought some stuff with them. So, oh, uh, yeah. the puppy kennel is pretty limited. It's right down the road, but we kind of just count this as one location. So like today, there's two girls here at my place that need to go back over there because they're approaching three to four weeks pregnant. And there's two girls over there <clears throat> who really need to get over here and do some work in the water. So they'll come, they'll swap out in other words. Um, and then I have, oh, let me just list them. Um, it's okay. Tanglefoot is in Pontotoc, Mississippi. It's about an hour from me. Um, it's okay. Lone star is in Wills point, Texas, which is about 40 miles on the east side of Dallas. Uh, it's okay. Flint Hills is in Wichita, Kansas. Um, it's okay. Fox Ridge is in Madisonville, Kentucky. Uh, it's okay. Bracken Creek is in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. It's okay. North, which is the first outpost we did is in Athens, Michigan. And then it's okay. East is in, um, Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, wow. Yeah. And there's a map on our website that shows like where everybody is. And if you hover over it, you can click and see like, uh, they had there's their own page on the website that shows all the dogs that live at that particular location and who the trainer and owner is and and you can learn more about you know each specific because each one does function really as its own kennel just underneath okay. the umbrella of of Southern Oak. Now, is there any studs or females that are you're kind of like mixing with those you know Chris Cross and I guess so to speak over as far as breeding goes or do you pretty much stay like in your local area with you know what I mean. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the females all stay in their, in their own area. Um, it's really tough on, on, so our females are trained and they work, so mm -hmm. they're not just sitting around, you know, popping pups out. Um, and we're pretty particular. We really follow some fairly strict guidelines from the United Kingdom on our breeding practices. So like mm -hmm. four litters per female, maximum five. Oh, wow. Um, and then we retire them and they go to a working home for their retirement. So they spend, you know, we retire them by the age of six. So really? they spend the last, you know, six years of their life in a working home, hopefully hunting at age seven, eight, nine, and slowing down at 10, sleeping on the couch and hanging with kids and that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. the girls kind of stay comfortable in one spot. You would not really want to rotate breeding females around too much. Um, but the boys definitely there are, there are significantly less studs as there are moms, you know? So I keep most of the boys here with me, but each location minus a couple, you know, Fox Ridge and Lone Star don't really have any studs. Um, so like this weekend stone who runs the Texas location, he's got a female that has to be bred to one of my studs. So he'll travel here this weekend. He's going to pick up two client dogs for training. Um, we're going to get her bread and then he's going to head back to Texas. So yeah, they kind of, kind of move back and forth. Yeah. I'm really kind of interested to hear more about, uh, I, I don't want to jump ahead too much here, but I am, since I'm on the thought, I do want to ask you like to me, um, now and this is going to sound like a stupid question just because I guess I've said it and I've read it, but to hear it from someone professional, I'd rather know is because, so there's American lab Labradors, correct? Right, and then there's there's British like you do is Eng English is one too, right? The they're more for show dogs though, correct? Yeah, right. That's right. And they've bred yeah, American so, and yeah, English. No one ever gets that. No one ever gets that right the first time. Oh um, well, I guess I got lucky. But I mean, so do people take the the um, English and the American and have bred those together to kind of get that boxer head and thicker body, right? Yeah. So. I'm going somewhere well, I mean, with this question. I mean, that that is no, what. It's great. Yeah, it's great. I mean, like, well, when we talk, when you talk about this, it's not. We're not even in the same category as right. like, hey, so there's a, a Labrador and a Poodle, and that's how you get a Labradoodle, right? Like, it's <laughs> yeah. we're we're talking about just 
Labradors. Right. It is, it is a breed. And so really the differences are um, more or less cultural and I can't explain how, how those came to be, but it's like, Hey, it would be the same as you being like, Hey, um, you know, on the West coast in the South, we got these dudes who like really love to surf and like are kind of free spirited and whatnot. And like, we're going to marry one of those to uh, a scholar from Rhode Island (laughs) and like, just kind of see what the pups are. You know what I mean? Like Uh we're still human beings. Right. Right. There's just some cultural differences and stuff. And like, if you, you know, if you say, Hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a Northeastern and I'm going to marry a girl from Puerto Rico and our kids are going to, you know, be a little Mm -hmm. darker, you know, it's just, you're talking about subtle differences within the breed. Mm -hmm. So the difference is you can create so many generations so quickly because, you know, you can breed them at two years old. And so you can do a lot more in a shorter span of time. Um, But yes, American Labradors, that term, there, there really are four categories. So American Lab is the term people use for Labrador retrievers whose pedigree has dogs who have accomplished things in field tests or working tests run in America. Hmm. So this would be like, Amer- at the top of this would be American field trial dogs. So like people will say white coat or AKC field trial dogs. Um, these are titles like FC, NFC, AFC. Mm-hmm. Um, and then below that, you're going to have all of your hunt tests, HRC tests. You're going to have master tests or AKC tests. So junior hunter, senior hunter, master hunter, uh, the VARA test, SRS. There's lots of different uh, styles of testing, but they all fall, fall under like this system of how we, Americans like to evaluate Labradors, right? Mm-hmm. So if they've been evaluated and their pedigree is full of American titles, you're going to call that an American lab. Um, what I breed are British labs, which is all encompassing for, um, the United Kingdom plus Ireland. So Ireland is in the South, not the North, but both really. So this would be dogs who have achieved field trial titles in the United Kingdom in their pedigree, right? Um, what you have to do to achieve a, a title in England is different and nuanced, a, quite a bit compared to what you have to do to achieve a title in America. There are a ton of overlapping things like your retrieving birds that have been shot. Right. Uh-huh. Um, but the, the differences are, are pretty major and that's where you see the differences in the dogs crop up over the course of, you know, a century of evaluating dogs like this. English dogs are dogs whose pedigree is filled with titles that have been earned in the show ring. So these are also called bench bred dogs this would be the the strongest contrast. So those dogs really in a lot of ways don't even look like or mm-hmm. resemble the field bred dogs, whether it's an American or a British field bred dog. And then the fourth category would just be Labradors. So this is just someone that says, Hey, I've got an AKC registered Labrador. You look at the pedigree and there are no titles and it's really not necessarily even a backyard breeder. Maybe they do all their health tests, but the dogs just really are a standard Labrador. They don't come from, eventually you're going to find some type of title in the pedigree way back, but they don't necessarily come from British or American field lines or show lines. They're just a Labrador. Mm -hmm. So those would be one you buy and like you could expect maybe to, you know, get some type of working ability out of it, but maybe not. Mm. Wow. That's, that's great information. I've, I've kind of wondered that and never really directly asked uh, someone that knows what they're talking about directly. So it's really good to hear that and something I'll probably be going back to listen to later on this. But uh reason I asked yeah. that is because <clears throat> I'm just, I guess I'm just saying this, that I know, like, I, I'm assuming that now that you said that it's kind of messing up what I even was going to say, because it shows my lack of knowledge in that area. But when you look at my dog, Rocky, he's, um, registered AKC and he's got some pretty good uh lines you know for his parents mm-hmm. and grandparents and stuff but uh anyways he's thicker and um he's just got that I mean no matter how hard he works in duck season I mean the lowest I've seen him probably get is like 88 89 pounds so looking at your the, the attraction to your guys's labs the the British labs and just everything that you've got at your kennels is really to me like that kind of thicker chest boxer head high drive, but also knowing how to shut it off. Cause Rocky, he has good drive and he can definitely be, you know, house dog and just relaxed, but he definitely doesn't have that drive, you know? So 
the attraction, like I said to yours, I was talk, we were talking the other day, is just that high drive. Um, what What is a typical stud in shape uh, working stud usually weigh, like say like a three or four-year-old mature pup weigh? I'd say on the smaller end, um, like our retired stud red was 58 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, and then on the bigger end, Ozzy, um, is about 80 pounds Mm -hmm. average for our boys like Rio Cedar Bruno, um, the, the new Hank. And we're actually about to announce this week. Um, those dogs are like between 65 and 75 pounds. That's pretty standard for our boys and our girls are between 45 and 62 pounds. Usually the girls are right around 50 pounds. Mm. Is it now Barton, is that easier on their health like a dog that i mean in shape is in shape like a human right i guess but <clears throat> like say if you got a working dog that's really in shape and his light weight's 88 to 90 pounds it seems like that could be tougher on a dog just because they're the muscular or the skeleton of the dog is bigger does that do you think that makes a difference or not really i think it can there was an article that came out about this um a couple of weeks ago and it like blew up on the internet. Every, everyone that lo- that runs American tests with big dogs was all upset about it. Cause essentially the article was saying smaller is better. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty careful. Even, even in the conversation about British American and, and English labs, I'm pretty careful to not say something is better. Um, Cause it's really just a, a, such a subjective personal preference. Yeah. Objectively speaking from health, I mean, it's undeniable that smaller dogs live longer. Their longevity is better. Um, I do think, I mean, so no knock on you. We've actually had dogs with this as well, but the breed standard is 80. So you get above 80 pounds, you're outside of breed standard. Hmm. Um, And so at that point, there are things, there are complications that arise within the breed that have to do with, with size, particularly when it comes to hips and elbows. Um, and then you do see, in my experience, a lot more issues with like ACL tears with bigger dogs. Mm -hmm. That said, I mean, there's a, there's some space for bigger dogs. And if you're hunting, you know, dry field, cut corn, killing big honkers in the Midwest all the time, a taller dog is super helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there there's give and take for both for, for the dogs that we breed like, and if you go over to England, you'll notice like they're very like steeped in tradition right mm-hmm. everything is is tradition and their shooting sports have to be that way because it's like a a dying thing over there like you, it's very rare to go hunting in england for birds like you, you've, you've got to be a pretty small part of a niche population that still enjoys that kind of thing and has access to it so for them keeping the dogs the size they've always been is incredibly important mm-hmm. so if you look at pictures from like 1915 of a Labrador retriever and you look at pictures of my dog, they look incredibly similar. Hmm. There are very, very few differences. Um, and so the, the, I don't mess. I mean, you say blocky head and everyone thinks of something different. You know, I'm not talking about the, you know, wheelbarrow with legs that is in the show ring. Mm, I'm talking yeah. about, it's a squared up head, right? Yes. Not, a, not yeah. a long skinny face, no, a right. square, a square head. Mm. Like that's a very traditional part of Labradors having muscular shoulders, um, having a, a long tail, uh, that's more of an otter tail, not a fluff tail. You don't want the like feathers coming out of the tail. Like in the show ring today, you see tails with like actual feathering coming out. Mm-hmm. That's not a Labrador. I mean, that's traditionally speaking, they're supposed to have a, a very rounded, like thick otter tail. Um, anyway, you didn't ask for all that, but I, I do think that the size that we have for me is my preference, even if it's a 50 pound female. They can haul in geese. They don't rock the boat too much. They're easy to deal with as far as travel. Um, you know, they fit in crates. They can, in other words, right. they're small enough to be convenient and big enough to do all the work. And I, I like that. <clears throat> and that's basically where I was going with that. I've kind of been talking around other people about those scenarios. And I, you, like you said, <laughs> there's a few things that, and I'm just going to use duck hunters because that's what I do most, right? But for example, but you start getting – you want to get people upset or, like you said, cause a big ruckus. You talk about their dog or you talk about the gun or shells they use. That's just like <laughs> how duck hunters are, I guess. But I'm not really like that. I'm just looking – and just because I talk about another dog doesn't mean 
I don't love my dog, right? Like, okay, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do next time. And this is what I want. And this is what I'm looking for. And, and I've mentioned that to people, just the being lighter. I always felt in my heart that it was healthier. I never heard no one say that until just asking you right now, but like, it just makes sense. Right. Like, and then the weight and getting him in and out and, and like just everything you said, rocking the boat and all that stuff. It doesn't take away yep. from the dog you have and that you love. I mean, it's the first one I trained and I got sure. a ton to learn, but also it really just intrigues me. Just, just everything about uh, what you guys do. So I guess that kind of roll us into, uh, we probably could stay on some of those topics for a while, but we'll try to move forward here is I kind of like to hear about Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy and how that started and, and what that process looks like. Yeah. So I'll walk you through that, but it is, it's, it's a great, um, it's a great follow-up for me. And it's, it, my answers to a lot of these questions have been informed since opening or since starting Cornerstone and doing like member training workshops with, with the guys from CGA because up until then I had, you know, my own ideas about dogs from different like breeding styles or, or pedigrees or whatnot. But now I've actually gotten to see a ton of these dogs because Cornerstone is not just made for, you know, British labs mm-hmm. only. We have everything. And I heck, the last, um, remember a weekend we had a, a fully, um, field bred poodle, we, we had wow. we have several people who have show showbred Labrador lines that have working uh, titles as well, and then we have American labs, we have British labs, we have just somebody that just got a lab, we have Golden. So that's been pretty cool for the last six years to to follow along and see the different styles of dogs so often and say, hey, well, I, I see you know I see the advantages here, I see the mm. differences here, and anyway. Um, as far as Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy goes, I mean, um, what year is it? Two, so we just turned six years old last week. Mm. Um, so back up seven years in 2016, I became friends with a father and son duo, um, Keith and Josh Parvin, and they bought a puppy from me. And, and Josh was like figuring out the the gun dog training and the gun dog field sports world. And his dad was big into it. And they were having a blast and there was a back then there was this thing called the british field trial society of america which was super fun i wish it were still around but had some issues that needed to work out that didn't get worked out and they were involved in that i was involved in that and um they called out of the blue one day and keith was like hey we're thinking about creating like this all-inclusive gun dog training platform um that is specifically a non-compulsion uh training method so mm-hmm. no force fetch and um i said yeah that, that sounds really cool and they were like the only problem is we we need someone like you to, to help do the videos and i was like yeah that sounds great at the time i was friends uh still am friends but at the time i was very close to the guys at rock house motion and i was like hey can we bring these guys in to create some marketing content for us so all four of us partnered up rock house josh keith and myself and created cornerstone and at the time as far as my knowledge goes, there was no online dog training platform other than videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So YouTube had some stuff that was, you could kind of piece together. There were DVDs, there were books. Um, So we created what I consider to be the first online digital dog, you know, gun dog training platform started out with like 110 videos. I think Um, quickly over the next year doubled. Um, We created what, what we call the complete gun dog Academy, which includes a ton of stuff, man. It's basic and advanced obedience, um, basic intermediate and advanced gun dog work. Uh, we even interviewed some veterinarians and had a, a module called vet talk. We did something that I had never seen before and created a module called how your dog learns, which is really on learning theory and philosophy um, just to kind of help people. The focus was never on, like this dog getting trained. The focus was on teaching people who had no idea how to train a dog, the art of training a gun dog so that they could replicate that and train multiple gun dogs. Right. Mm. So that was really our goal um, was to teach people to train their own dogs and focus on the handler and the trainer, not necessarily each dog. So we launched that thing and I guess that was, um, 
yeah, 2017 in April, we officially launched it to the public and took off with it. And we've been, uh, keeping it going since then. That's awesome. And, uh, I, you said some, <clears throat> I don't want to jump out of that too fast. I mean, is there any more, can you give us kind of like a little more of a deeper dive into Cornerstone Dog Academy? I mean, is that mainly you do like if someone's kind of thinking about buying that program and using it, um, can you tell us a little bit more how things are structured and what sure. to expect? Yeah, there are really two primary options. Um, there's the complete gun dog Academy, which is, is my training videos and it's really everything you need to train a dog start to finish. Mm. And then there's what we call 52 plus, and that's Josh working a dog through the complete Academy with his own sort of, you know, everyone does things a little differently. So it's got his own kind of twist to it. And Josh works a dog through it for um, over a year. So I think it's actually 52 plus means 52 weeks, so a full year, but it's actually 56 weeks. And that thing has three to four videos per week, including a check-in video um, and really walks you like holds your hand through the process all the way from start to finish. So complete gun dog Academy would be for someone probably like you who you've got field experience, right? You've got your dog, you've, you've trained and you're like, Hey, the next one I want to do start to finish. I want to do it right. I want to follow a program. 52 plus is for the guy that's like, Hey, I don't know. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Never done this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I need to help the whole way through. And, um, or you could get both. It's all available. Like when you sign up, you can watch the videos on your computer, but there's also an app, which is super helpful. So oh, wow. everything's laid out, structured on the app. You can search for particular terms on the app, find the videos. Everything is um, going to be organized in the complete based on what you're working on. So uh, if you're working on like pattern blinds, you can go to lining in the intermediate gun dog and you can pull up pattern blinds and it's going to show you exactly how we set them up, uh, what they're used for. And, um, yeah, it's great, man. We filmed it wow. all in HD. Almost every field video has drone footage, so you can see an above, you know, bird's eye view of the drill, which gives you a really good idea of like the, the angles and what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, we really, really tried hard to create something that was, you know, a, a notch above the competition at that point in time. And uh, we've honestly been working the last six years to make sure we stay there, man. We're literally always out in the field, filming new content, adding new training stuff, updating it. Um, and then the last thing you get with Cornerstone, which is pretty awesome is, is a membership to a private Facebook group. And that group is a super cool community of folks. Just you mentioned a while ago, if you want to make someone mad, you will talk about their dog. Mm -hmm. And in the gun dog world, there's just this weird sense of, of, animosity mm -hmm. and if you go into most of the gun dog training groups on facebook or or you know the old school chat threads and stuff you you see people that are just like really always kind of antsy to tear someone down mm -hmm. right you ask yep. for advice and you kind of yeah you ask for advice in a group like that and then you kind of cringe like here it comes you know yep. get blasted <laughs> Yep. Our uh, our group is is a very like solid source of encouragement and help. That's so cool. if you're in there and you're like, hey, I got a seven month old and we're on week number, you know, 12 and I'm struggling with this post a video, you're going to get 30, 35 comments of people like, hey, here's what I did that helped me or try this. And it's it's incredibly helpful, super cool benefit to be a part of uh, the Cornerstone community. And yeah, that's huge. I actually wasn't aware of that because I think that's, I don't know. I, I obviously I can't cover all these questions that I had, but there was a lot of the questions about line drills and this and that, that I, I don't think we'll be able to get to today. But I thought, man, you know, if you're, if you're interested in that and you're training a dog, you really might want to look, take a look at that Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy because not just for the videos themselves, which are sound amazing but also i mean i've seen a few samples of them from some friends that use it but to have that community that's uh that's huge um yeah do you know that app um i didn't i wasn't aware of that either does that have like kind of a a generalized q a in it where like maybe like questions that are common people have a lot like um uh, my my puppy won't bring my bumper back to me i mean do you kind of have a q a that answers a lot of those kind of questions that Come, I mean, I get, 
like I said, <laughs> Martin, I'm not no dog trainer. I just trained a dog. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But We've people, all been there. people assume like, oh, you know all those answers. And I'm like, man, I just send them to other people most of the time unless it was something I, simple I could fix. And usually to me, I see that is such a general question that gets asked all the time. And maybe I'll say what I reply and then I want to hear the professional opinion. But I hear people say, my dog, I'm freaking out. My lab won't bring anything back to me. You know, and I'm like, well, first off, how old are they? And then they tell me, oh, they're 12 weeks. And I'm like, how many times did you throw them a bumper? <laughs> oh, like, it's like their eighth retreat. I go, man, you you know, like, you already burnt that. That dog's like a little kid. And after the first or second one, he was done. And then they come back a couple months later. Yeah, that was the problem. I'm like, because oh, everybody man. wants to, it's a lab. It's a retriever. You want to throw it and yeah. bring it back. So what would, do you have... A Q and A section like that somewhere in your program, and then also, yes. how would you respond to someone asking that question? Yeah, so that's great. So most of that Q and A happens in the Facebook group, right? You get a lot of like, "Hey, I'm struggling with this," and people are like, "Whoa, whoa, pump the brakes, dude." Um, or, or what? Maybe they they just give suggestions, but yeah, definitely can search in there and find those. But within the app, you can ask, you can comment on any video. Uh, and we've got a team um, every day that goes and replies to any comments that are left on videos. So then when you're coming through for the first time and you're in that video, you can see the comments that have been left on that video. Mm. So, yes, if you're in like um, a foundations course with your, you know, your brand new puppy and you're doing intro to retrieving with your puppy and you're like, dang, my pup's not bringing it back. There are comments under there about pups not bringing it back. Um and we try to address most of those questions in the videos as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the 52 plus is actually like we drip those videos to you. So like if you sign up today for 52 plus, you can't have all 52 weeks. Um, you're given a section at a time because what we found is people want to jump too <laughs> far forward yep. Yep. and people get kind of frustrated about that. And we're like, look, I promise you the, it's worth waiting. It is worth mm -hmm. just chilling out and going at, the, at a slower pace. Cause like you said, everybody gets a puppy and puppies are so incredibly intelligent. They're, they're eager to learn. They do anything for a treat. Right. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's assumption is that they have the next Kobe Bryant. Yeah of gun dogs and and they just push and push and push and you, i've seen a lot of dogs ruin that way um i've seen some really really nice gun dogs that didn't even know their name at like four months old oh, wow. you know they wow. were just chilling and having fun and playing best dog i ever trained uh when i first got into all this she didn't care anything about retrieving until she was about six months old mm -hmm. um so yeah every dog's different every dog goes at their own pace uh, it's not really like a cookie cutter. You got to do this by this day sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for responding to that because, um, I, that is a massive, that's like one of the top ones I've got asked. And I'm like, man. And like you said, I just, it, they all do think it's Kobe Bryant and they, and that's, that's fine. Cause it's your dog, right? You spend all the time with sure. it, but <laughs> You gotta walk before you can, uh, or you gotta crawl before you can walk, I guess. So that's right. But I totally that's get right. it. I totally get it. Looking back now, but uh, it depends too on on the person too. Sometimes people are more uh, like to read the manual before they put something together. That's kind of me. So then there's other people that think oh, I can do this. There's only five bolts and <laughs> two screws. Yeah. I'll just do it, and then yeah, it just kind of turns into disaster. But anyways, okay. Um, Man, I, there's just these big ones I want to get. I know they take a hair longer, but uh, I know we're trying to stay at the hour mark. But what's it look like good, man. Go for it. before we get into some of the other questions that I might probably move a hair quicker? But what's it look like getting a pup from start to finish before you ever even know about your pup, that process, then to the pickup day, go home, you know, all that stuff? I'm going to give you my very brief but totally ideal version of that. Cause there are lots of like little ways that you can change it, this, this path. Um, but I, in an ideal world, someone contacts Southern Oak Kennels via the contact form on our website. And there's an application on there and you say, I'm looking to get a puppy. And ideally when you want one between six and 12 months from now, you can choose other options, but 
six and 12 months gives us time to really try to figure out a good fit for you. What do you want? You want yellow female, black male, and then what type of drive level, intensity level, what are you going to do with the dog? There's lots of little things you can kind of select there. So we, we figure out a litter or two that's going to be a good fit for you. If you place a deposit on one of those litters, um, pregnancy takes, we send you an email, pups are born. We send an email, they're going home on X day. At that point, it would be totally awesome if every one of our clients bought Cornerstone Gundog Academy and started watching the videos about taking a puppy home because mm-hmm. then you're educated on what to do um, as far as – and that's whether you're buying a dog from us or anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you're educated on the things that you need to expect about bringing a pup into your new home. So watch Cornerstone uh, at eight weeks old on a, a, the Saturday after they turn eight weeks old. So like this Saturday, we've got a litter of pups going home. Um, there are only five in the litter. People are coming from all over. I think one guy is coming from California um, and California or Oregon. I can't remember. These folks show up. They meet the parents. Um, we hang out. They pick their puppy. Puppy goes home. Um, they're going to follow, hopefully, the videos in Cornerstone just to give them guidelines on how to raise their puppy. And then there are two options. Either they're going to say, hey, I'm going to do this myself. And they're going to use the complete or they're going to use 52 plus or they're going to say, hey, I want some help. Um, I'm going to send my dog back to Southern Oak Kennels for training. We only train dogs from our own breeding program, so mm. we don't take okay. in any outside dogs. OK, so if you're the guy that's in California, you might send your dog to Noah, who is in um, uh, uh, Flint Hills in Wichita, Kansas. That's our furthest west. Um, so at six to eight months old, once your dog has his or her adult teeth the puppy come back for training you're going to pay us to train that dog for probably six to seven months and at the end of that every dog's different but at the end of that typically we're going to give you back a dog that's ready to go duck hunt Mm -hmm. um and what i mean by that is steady delivering to hand introduced to gunfire uh decoys introduced to birds including live birds introduced to all the things that you're going to experience in a duck blind marking Doubles, land and water, taking straight lines out to 75, 80 yards at least, stopping on a whistle at close distances and casting. Now, you still have a very young dog, so you're not going to have a reliable, you know, you've got a, a 12 to 14 month old dog. So you're not going to have this dog that can go run big 200 yard blinds mm-hmm. at this point. Um, <clears throat> but a dog that you can take hunting and introduce to all the things in the in a real hunting scenario and a dog's not going to freak out because it's already been trained. Mm-hmm. And then really from there there's two two more paths you can use something like cornerstone cornerstone would be my preference to continue the training of that dog and continue its progress at this point cornerstone i think is incredibly valuable because like if you take your dog to the trainer and get your dog back it's not a robot you've got to keep that thing going Mm -hmm. um if you let it just chill you're going to lose all the stuff that you paid tons of money for right Mm -hmm. so with cga it's given you the ability to to go run your own drills to keep that progress going. Or we have guys who will hunt the dog the first season and then send it back to us for two, three, four more months of just tuning up and honing in some of the things that might've been lacking in the season as the dog uh, grows. Hmm. So that's really for me, (laughs) excuse me, the ideal path um, to getting a gun dog from us. That's, that's fully trained and accomplished in the field. And we have a lot of people that do that. And we have some people that send the dog back for the second time and the dog may be with us for eight months and they want us to put a hunt test title on the dog. Oh, okay. um, and we do that as well. So it just really depends on what you want. And we have, do we have dogs that they go home at eight weeks and I see them when they tag us on Instagram and they're out duck hunting and they train the dog themselves completely. And I may never see that dog come to our place again. I just mm. see the tags and share the posts. Mm. Wow. And I, let me ask you this. Let's say uh, take some, uh, the person takes them home at eight weeks and then they train them and then they hunt and then uh, they they got all the basic things down and they, they're kind of what you do, you train them for, like the, the pups that come in there that are there for six to eight months or whatever. Let's say yeah. they're past all that and they're not going to send them to you at all for that. That's already done. But then they're like, yeah, I want to send them now for two or three months to get the more advanced stuff for like their second season or whatever. Do you guys do that too? Or do you rather prefer to have them both times if you're going to do that? Um, no, we will definitely do that. Okay. Um, essentially 
like when I said, there's multiple like little split offs of this yeah. plan <laughs> where it can change. Um, that's one of them. And we don't mind that. We just say, Hey, like there's probably going to be an extra yeah. month or two mm-hmm. where we have to get to know where this dog is. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it may happen quickly, but we got to build a relationship with the dog. We've got to become the dog's trustworthy leader. And then we've got to dig in and see what is the dog doing and not doing. Mm-hmm. And we have some that come in and it's like, holy cow, this guy crushed it. And we have some that come in and it's like, okay, in your mind, this dog is in the 12th grade ready to go to college. In reality, this dog's in middle school. And we got to <laughs> backtrack a little bit yeah. um, and, and everything in between. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a totally normal path for us. In fact, I've got one coming uh, to Texas this month. That's doing just that. Okay, because I was kind of wondering, like you you already said it, but in a way, I'm like, I wonder what how big of a factor that plays in, like, say they do know all that stuff, and the guy, like you said, crushed it, but then getting used to you, it's like, how do you break that? Do- I might be too big of a question to answer, but like, how do you break that dog into looking at you and respecting you? I mean, if they're trained, they pro- and you know the commands, it probably makes it a whole lot easier than someone that really doesn't know what they're doing. I guess you could probably get them to listen to you pretty quick, huh? Yeah, you can. And every dog's different. People ask about dogs bonding and whatnot. Like if I go outside um, to the kennels here, you know, my boys are out there. And so Moose, Bruno, Cedar, Rio and Ozzy. um, Like if you watch those dogs interact with me, you would think that I'm like the only human on earth that that they care about. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. they. But if I leave and Chris, the guy that feeds them every day, <laughs> walks out there, <laughs> they treat Chris very similarly, right? Mm. Um, what's crazy is I didn't raise any of those dogs. They're all from England and Ireland. Mm. So they were all raised and trained and accomplished field trial accomplishments with someone else before they came to a completely different country and wow. worked with me, who talks totally differently than <laughs> the right, guys that right. raised them. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's... It, Knowing the commands is important. Knowing just how to read dogs and how to work with a dog is infinitely more important. Mm-hmm. Um, and then building trust with those dogs. I mean, you just don't want to, you don't want to start trying to do too much too quickly um, with a, a new dog. You really want to develop a relationship. You want that dog to think of you as, as not just in charge, but trustworthy, right? They yeah. don't want to be, you don't want them scared of you. Um, you want them to think that, man, when this guy shows up, we do really fun stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Um, man, it's time is rolling quick. I, and I know we're going to do some more. Hopefully I'd love to, because we're not even going to cover half of what I had, <laughs> but I did want to touch on these big ones. So yeah, let's do it. Um, you said something earlier. I already had the question written down, but now I'm like, Oh, cause I, I know I did force fetch and, um, I'm curious what, What's your thoughts on force fetch? I guess I'll just word it that way. We'll let you yeah. talk about um, it. Or, I mean, yeah. I mean that, that, that's no, kind of general. No, I'm down to talk about it. Um, no, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, I am I can give a real brief answer. Um, okay. I And this is where I do think some things are better and some things are <laughs> worse. Yeah, no, be honest. I mean, we that's um, what we're here for, the people here. Yeah. yeah. Compulsion-based training, force fetch, I think is often – incredibly misunderstood Mm -hmm. and i have friends that use force fetch and they're not at all harming dogs right Mm -hmm. um and force fetch has nothing to do with teaching a dog to pick things up it Mm -hmm. has everything to do with teaching a dog to turn off pressure um so you're teaching the dog to learn by turning off the pressure Uh, that's the compulsion aspect of it so um it's really people always talk about positive reinforcement training only positive reinforcement is when a dog does something good, you give it a reward. You're Mm -hmm. right. You're trying to continue a desired behavior. Mm -hmm. I like positive reinforcement. I don't think that you can completely train any dog with only positive reinforcement. The Mm -hmm. people who think that, uh, there are people out there. They hardly ever are able to demonstrate it in gun dog work. Um, I would say really never At, Mm -hmm. at some point you're going to have to use punishment, but you don't have to use compulsion. It's really a choice. It has become like the absolute gold standard of training in America. So if you post a question on Facebook, like, Hey, I need to help my dog do this. Someone's going to say, Oh, you got to force fetch it. Mm. Like it is just the go-to answer. 
none of my dogs are force fetched, not a single one. Mm. Um, and that is not the style that I like to use to train. We mm. do use punishment and training. A slip lead is punishment. Mm. We're just not using compulsion. So, <clears throat> which is a whole different conversation from, you know, punishment e-collar, um, what you use it for, but compulsion based training has its place. It definitely works. It's definitely something I think is required for American field trials because of the amount of pressure dogs feel taking an angle back with a shoulder wind off a point at 350 yards. That's mm-hmm. an incredible ask of a dog. They've got to understand that if they don't do that, there's tremendous pressure. So that's, that's really the nature of, of force fetch, what it's used for turning pressure off to make good decisions like that for gun dogs, for 95% of people, it's not necessary. At this point, the problem is we have lineages of, I mean, dozens of generations of dogs in the pedigree where every single dog was trained with force fetch. So I am in the camp that believes that has caused more problems than good. And the problems are lack of desire or mouth issues, hold issues, uh, even re- just general retrieving issues, keep away issues mm. that because of force fetch, you have masked what genetically what's there. Mm. Essentially you've trained around it. Mm-hmm. In the UK, there's no force fetch. There's hold conditioning, right? And so the natural desire to retrieve and deliver to hand with a soft mouth is evaluated in field trials, and they don't train around it. So if your dog chomps birds or if your dog refuses, like if you are at a trial in the UK and a dog runs at a bird, stops, goes to pick up the bird, and then instead of picking it up, looks back up at you, it's called a blink. You're eliminated. You're mm-hmm. done. So those dogs just don't get bred. <laughs> wow. And for, yeah. in my mind, that is a far superior way to evaluate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm not a force fetch fan. I understand force fetch. I'm not the guy out there saying, Hey, it's abuse. You know, shouldn't be doing it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I think it's not an overall positive move for the breed. And I think that we're just getting to the point where we're really starting to see that. I also think it's incredibly difficult to do from a timing standpoint without really understanding the philosophy behind it. And the guys who are really, really good at it are the ones who are actually incredibly gentle when they do it because they understand the timing. And then there's a lot of people out there that are just absolutely ruining dogs, um, trying to force fetch them when they don't really understand the point. Hmm. So you mean kind of trying to push through training too fast? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, or just too much pressure or not removing the pressure at the right time. Yeah, force yeah. fetch is generally done with an ear pinch, a yeah. knee collar, or a, a toe hitch. Um, and those, the pressure is put on. So with force fetch, you're applying the pressure. And then if the dog makes the right decision, you're removing the pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not punishment. It's negative reinforcement. Okay. So positive reinforcement, the positive doesn't mean good. You have to get that like an emotional part out of your brain. Positive reinforcement, positive means you add something. Reinforcement means you're wanting the behavior that is happening to keep happening. Yeah. Right. Yep. So positive reinforcement, I'm adding a treat or I'm adding a pet or I'm adding verbal praise yep. in order to get this to keep happening. Negative just means you're removing something. So there's this thing the dog doesn't like when it does the thing I want it to do. I remove it. Mm-hmm. I rem- and that's that's like what force pinch. is. Correct. Yep. Or uh, uh, continuous on a collar or a toe yep. hitch. When people apply too much pressure or they don't remove it at the exact right time. Or they just, instead of teaching the dog what the dog is supposed to do, they just teach through the pressure. The idea is not to to use the pressure to teach the dog how to pick something up. I I think a lot of amateur trainers try that, Mm -hmm. and that's a a fail. You need to teach the dog to reach out and grab the object first, and then apply the pressure if you're doing force fetch. Now, all this to say, I'm no force fetch expert by any stretch, and I'm, you know, happy to listen to people talk about it all day. This is just what I've seen and what yeah. I've heard. I've heard about yeah. Mayor's stories. No, it's folks, what I've you know. seen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, without diving too deep and getting to your own, your own program before people like purchase it or whatever, how are you? Cause the way you word that makes sense to where it almost kind of erases this question I want to ask you, but like, because it isn't a natural a dog's most dogs natural ability to pick something up anyways or desire I should say so I guess if that desire is strong there and you have a good breeding 
they're going to want to naturally do it anyways. But how are you, you know, getting <clears throat> a dog's coming, a young dog's coming back, um, haven't hunted yet, nothing like that. They're in training and they come back and they drop the, let's just say this happens. They drop the bumper two, three feet from you or even in hunting. Ah, let me stay there. I don't want to jump ahead because if I do, that means they weren't trained <laughs> properly in the right. first place. But in training, right. a, a young dog drops a bumper a couple feet back. What is your, like getting them to hold? How's that process in a short capsule look? Yeah, we use just hold conditioning. So it starts with uh, a glove in a hand mm -hmm. um, or with a wooden dowel. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, hold conditioning should always be the first thing people do. Mm -hmm. And it is the first thing pros do in the force fetch process. Yeah. So we use positive reinforcement to teach a dog to hold an object. Um, so very simple, right? You mm -hmm. hold it. And then when you, when I tell you to give it good, you mm -hmm. know, and there is like, there's, there are the dogs who love to retrieve and then you go and stick a wooden dowel in their mouth and they give you like the alligator death roll, you know, like, yeah. nope, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> holding this thing. Yeah. So it can be a, a bit of a fight, right? But we're not applying pressure in any other way. It's just, you hold the object good. We're associate with the hold command mm -hmm. and then you'll see the dogs. You always can tell when it's done right. You see the dogs run back and they go to try to spit the, you know, you can tell they drop their head and you're like, no, hold. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to keep this thing. And, and yeah. they come back. Or you can see the dogs where too much pressure is, is given and you say hold and they stop and they drop it and they drop their tail. And it's like, oh, shoot, you know, and we usually play games with it uh, in the yard. Once we once we swap it to the field, we play hold, fetch, hold, release games with them. Uh, with my puppies, we do a fetch, hold, release using clicker and treat which is tough to do because the timing has to be perfect or you'll have your dog spit the dummy out to get the treat but it's definitely doable and those dogs that have been through the fetch hold release program that we do in cornerstone like their hold is is tremendous mm. um so yeah that's what we normally do i mean almost every puppy that comes to us at six months old is dropping the dummy at, at three yards out you know super common usually which just is takes that, us is that, just a little bit okay so you're saying if they come to you that's common but if they're with you the whole time, that's probably not, right? Yeah, it's no way they're not dropping it, no. Yeah. I mean, what at what age do you, in your program are they at that point where they're holding it? Or they're hold, uh, hold conditioned? Um, we do it right when we get them. So the first thing we do is six months. Now, if they stay with me, I'm I'm t teaching them that as a puppy. Okay. And that's yeah. and you can teach them that as a puppy, huh? Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we, kinda... use, we have these little puppy dummies. Um these little fire hose dummies that Cornerstone re re Retriever Training Supply makes. And they don't have a rope on them, so there's no temptation to like throw it by the rope, you know, or yeah. for puppies to play with the rope. And we use those puppy dummies on and a, a place board and teach them very early to reach out, pick it up, hold it, and deliver it. Fetch, hold, release. Mm. Um, and it's man, it's it's pretty bulletproof. Now, adult teeth will, when they lose their teeth, they'll start dropping it usually, and you'll have to reinforce the behavior again. Um, but it's not difficult at that point. It's pretty easy. Yeah. I'm, you know what? I, I'm looking at some other stuff and I'm like, I'm, it'd be too short to touch on some of this. Stuff. I know we were talking about e collar, but I guess maybe let's, let's finish this hour out. We only got a few minutes left on force fetch because this is such a big topic. You probably, I'm sure you could probably do a whole episode, I bet, almost on it if you wanted to, but. What what is another? I gave you a scenario of a young dog bringing uh, a bird back and dropping it, which that would never you would never even take them on. If, I'm assuming if they did that, not saying a dog's perfect, gonna be perfect when they first go on their first couple of hunts. That if they drop something, I'm sure that has to happen. And it's dogs makes mistakes like we do, but more than likely, I bet you that's not very often for you. Um, what it does happen. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Um, I mean, you'll like, let's just say you train this dog and, and you go out and for the first time ever, the dog is introduced to a speckle belly goose. Like mm -hmm. you've just trained with ducks, right? And a goose flies over your, your pit blind and somebody smokes it and dog goes out and is like, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. and gets halfway back and drops it. I mean, for us, yeah, you could technically try to fix that by force fetch, I guess. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, the idea then is if you say fetch, the dog understands I got to turn this pressure off and pick this object up. Um, but for us, I'm just going to teach that through positive reinforcement. Like I'm going to go get the bird. 
get the dog all excited about it, throw the bird for a few retrieves, and then it's not going to happen again, right? And I might have to do that with multiple different kinds of birds. We have to do it with thunder launchers. We use thunders in our training, and they're like a plastic dummy. And mm-hmm. a lot of dogs don't like that. So the first time you shoot one, they go over and they're like, ah, it's like the dog finding a water bottle. They're like, well, that's not what I'm here to pick up. Mm-hmm. And so we have to pick it up, get the dog excited, tell them to hold it. And then usually it's off to the races from there. Wow. So you, you're confident that, like you said, if that's the first time they saw a spec and they picked it up, got a little ways and like, ah, this is big or this thing's flopping on me or whatever, and they drop it, you're confident that with that positive reinforcement, uh, or is that the right proper term? Did I use that? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You could yeah, get well, them to do that and not. Hold. You could get them to not do that again, right then and there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you're just but so if they have the right foundation, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying I could like take someone's dog that I don't know what in the world's been done to it and try to fix it right there. Mm-hmm. But my dogs, I know that I, I mean I've seen these scenarios happen. I've seen it happen um, in hunt tests when they bring out like these gnarly ducks that were used yesterday <laughs> in august yeah and the dogs are like nah man i'm good <laughs> it's like yeah. hey i, I you, you fail the test right so you're like sorry judges but you go take the duck you ask if you can borrow a duck take it back to the truck and you could usually within five minutes you have the dog picking the duck up every time and is and then it's, is it all kind of just by like is the whole method behind it or concept getting them to want to please you or just like how are you using that when you're doing that, like right in that moment, what are you doing that makes them want to do that and pick it up? So if, if they're not really wanting to mentally, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, for sure. So the, the idea is, I mean, if they're not wanting to mentally, why is like, why are they not wanting to? Typically mm-hmm. it's because it's something unfamiliar, right? So you mm-hmm. just are familiarizing. You're just socializing to that thing. Um, if they're not wanting to in general, because they just have overall, lack of desire to pick up birds then you got to go way way back that's right? deeper now huh? you shouldn't you shouldn't have been hunting with that dog yeah um if they don't want to because it's a strange object or another instance would be um i have had several young dogs um get just absolutely like lambasted by a canada goose right so yep. gooses and <laughs> decoys and especially lessers it seems like they're just like no nah, man i'm not going with you and they turn around and wounded goose, start, goose starts to fight them well that could really damage a young dog yeah where they just don't want to get crippled birds anymore you know so at that point you could go the force route um my preference is to go find some live pigeons and clip their wings and get the dog excited about chasing live birds you can most definitely do that mm. um and so I just that's I like to take the positive reinforcement route when it comes to that type of training as yeah. much as possible. Now, if I have taught a dog like how to to carry a bird, the dog knows to hold, um, and the dog like I'll give you an instance that I've seen happen, and the dog goes and gets a duck that just got absolutely like obl- obliterated, yeah. yeah, and runs twenty feet away from me, drops it, and starts just ripping it to shreds, right. Mm-hmm. Like at that point, I'm, I'm going to punishment. Mm-hmm. Like at this point, we know to hold, you know, to bring it to me. Now you're in, you know, you're choosing your own reward. You're not choosing what you're supposed to do. So now we're going to inflict punishment. Gotcha. Okay. Whether it's a collar or um uh, slip lead or whatever. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's, yeah, it's making sense. I mean, I really like that idea. Honestly, I do. I really, I, I'm definitely not in any type of disagreement. Like I said, I'm, I've, it, Dog training to me is like such an open thing when you're that new at it. You know what I mean? It's like so, sure. so much to it that I'm interested to hear. So I haven't really formed saying, I have probably said that, like, oh, you need to force fetch. I guarantee you I've told people that just because that's what I experienced, <laughs> right? I've never seen the other way, but hearing what you're saying, is sure. like, that's kind of exciting, you know, to like, if you do this right and you make the foundations right, like you're saying, you can definitely um, have a great experience and, and have a great dog that's been proven yeah, honestly, absolutely hundreds of thousands yeah, I mean, of times. my dogs are yeah my dogs are here picking yeah. up anything you ask them to yeah. and holding it as long as you want you know what i mean yeah. just never none of one of them's ever had an ear pinch you know yeah no that's awesome so well uh we've hit the hour mark barton and i know you're busy at the kennels there can you give everybody like all you, the places people can find you at and all that yeah absolutely um I've enjoyed the conversation very much. Me too. Um, and yeah, so uh, 
working backwards, Cornerstone Gundog Academy dot com. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram as well. And then Southern Oak Kennels dot com also on Facebook and Instagram. And then personally, um, it's just Barton Ramsey on Instagram. Uh, you'll be kind of bored. It's really like I think people follow me expecting to be like this outdoorsy account. It's really just me and my kids. So mm-hmm. my 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 wife and kids and me is kind of like a dad account. Uh, but I am on there if you want to reach out directly. Um, and if you do the contact form through Southern Oak Kennels with any questions you have, I'd be happy to get back to those. If anybody wants to reach out or DM the Southern Oak Kennels Instagram account, it's probably faster. And yeah, uh, looking forward to chatting some more and uh, getting into to whatever we can in the future, man. Yeah, I thank you. I appreciate you so much for coming on. And uh, I know the listeners are going to love this. And, and you know how it is on the fir- the first one, you're kind of building the foundation uh, you don't really want to jump ship and talk about all these other things when we haven't had the the basis and the foundation built. So I, that was great information already. I was like, I'm really excited about the next one, honestly, and I'm sure everyone else listening is too. So thanks, everybody, for listening in. And Barton, thank you again for coming on. Absolutely, man. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you guys on the next one.